I'm Mara um, Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited to be talking about the fantastic new series, Mrs. Davies. We are joined today by showrunner, executive producer, and writer Tara Hernandez, and executive producer and writer Damon Lindelof. And in in starting to talk about the the initial conceptualization of this, I love that it was kind of the two of you sitting and brainstorming, kind of like early 2020, and starting to think about what if we had technology that could give us more definitive answers and and how people would respond to that. Because I love the theme in the show that it's not technology forcing people to utilize it in a certain way it's it's all kind of people handing themselves over in terms of free will um, and so I was interested in in how that thought process led to a lot of the conceptualization of Mrs. Davis as this central character in the way that you've crafted her into the series I think that's you know one of the things that's been really enjoyable about talking about the show is insightful getting incredibly insightful questions like that I I think that Tara and I, and certainly a lot of the other creatives behind the scenes were, were feeling what you're describing, which is we were starting to get very confused about decisions that we thought we were making of our own free will or that we were getting pushed into things. So it's like we have the illusion that if you if you say great pizza restaurant near me into a Google search bar, that it's curating for you the best pizza that is G you know, geographically located close to you versus what's actually happening, which is that there are some pizza places that pay Google to um, to put them higher on their on their web search. And so suddenly this idea of the magician's force, um, you know, where you're not actually picking a card out of the deck, but you're picking exactly the card that they want you to. And so this sort of anxiety of Oh my God, I was just talking about this thing the other day with some close friends. And then suddenly my Instagram feed started sen sending me like vacation information about uh, Seville. And I'd never talked about going there before. Um, like, am I being surveyed? And am I okay with being surveyed? Because I kind of want to go to Seville. Right. And so those were the, those were the questions that were sort of, you know, bonking around in our, our creative, brain pans and we wanted to create a very silly show as a way of dealing with this sort of frightening idea of like, do I make decisions or are they being made for me? And it, it sounds like the idea of, of having, um, you know, a nun and the idea of a convent central to the story as well was also something that came up very early on when the two of you were even just brainstorming about what are some ideas of different projects that we could mm -hmm. potentially conceptualize together. Um, and I love the the juxtaposition and the exploration that it gives you in looking at people's relationships to both spaces where they can look for definitive answers in a way that you can't necessarily in religion. And so how did you want to make sure that every single episode is really kind of questioning the relationship between these two spaces and the way that that's constantly evolving? Yeah, I, I I think you you nailed it. Is that you just you infuse every episode with that thesis statement that how is this episode you know differentiating from the last episode and that it is that exploration and you know when we get into episode two and we sort of want to sort of introduce you know our fighters like in one you know corner we've got you know the 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 power of this algorithm and you know that uh, we see this beautiful demonstration of you know Mrs. Davis able to you know deliver all of these pianos to to an older gentleman who's you know looking to to find just one specific piano and that it, it looks miraculous and it's that's a demonstration of you know her it's power and you know over here in in the other corner is you know Simone's personal relationship with her faith which is you know turning over the card that it is quite literally Jesus Christ that she's in a relationship with and as she's embarking on this quest you know how this access that she has to you know her her Lord and Savior gives her you know information that you know she otherwise may not have known that's going to advance her in in her quest and on her mission so it's just about you know sort of that push pull of sort of how these two sort of um you know warring or these two identities are sort of you know vying for her and are the audience's attention and just trying to to weave that into to the story you know at, at every turn because you know as if you've seen the show 
it can feel like this, you know, wild adventure, but to kind of bring us back to our thesis statement and certainly by the end of this season, you know, have have Simone sort of look at these two ideas as they relate to her personal journey and sort of how she wants to to move forward with or without them, I think is uh, what this season has been about. I also love that you're kind of touching upon that idea of, of the, the what's the central thesis of each of the episodes, because it really is a show that creates so many different questions and, and dialogues in every single scene and every single moment. And in kind of like even just writing the pilot, it sounds like it wasn't even just where is the first season going to go, but what's the what's the groundwork that we can start laying for future seasons? So there's kind of all these strands that we can start to see building. And there's things where it doesn't necessarily feel like we're going to get the answers for everything straight away, but it's building in such a way that that the inquisitiveness is kind of part Mm -hmm. of the adventure. Um, And so how was that important for you to kind of structure in the idea of future seasons and future elements and and really kind of gain that trust with the audience of it's okay if I don't get all the answers up front? Well, as an expert in exactly how to delegate answers to questions (laughs) joking um it's a it's an imperfect science to say the least and i think that you know one of the one of the things that we really had going for us was that we we had these eight episodes and that if we just looked at it as we've got four episodes to ask questions and then we've got four episodes to basically answer questions we may not answer every single one of them as satisfyingly as we need to but like what are the core questions um, and more importantly, what matters to the characters? Because there's always like a couple of different conversations happening around a show. One is, what are the questions that the characters in the show need to have answered in order to resolve whatever they need to have resolved? And then the other is like, we're watching at home and we're like, well, we need to know that. Um, and the more you can overlap those things, uh, you get it, you get the audience to care about the same thing that the characters are, the more successful you, you, you are making that show. At the same time, when you're making something out of nothing, as we were with Mrs. Davis, um, a lot of it is really as simple as, and it's very difficult to do this well, can we create a world inhabited by people that the audience wants to spend more time in after eight episodes? Part of that is leaving a couple of things dangling or, uh, or there are promises of things to come, uh, but the sort of idea of like, I'm not entirely sure what would happen next, but I really want to know what happens next. Um, Like that's kind of what you're gunning for. Um, I think if everything is wrapped up and tied in a, in a, in a neat little bow, a, that's not really reflective of life, you know, like that, like fundamentally we do look for some sort of authenticity in storytelling where it's like a, a, a common criticism is it felt too pat. It felt too clean or life is a little bit me- more messy than that. And on the other poll, it's like, that was so ambiguous that I don't even know what the hell it means. And I'm frustrated. I've dealt with both of those things and I'll take the former over the latter any day of the week at this point. And one of the things that's so engaging is that every time any character walks onto screen, we don't know immediately and we kind of gradually learn what is their relationship with with the AI technology, you know, because it's like if two if two young girls walk onto screen, has that been a part of the fabric of their whole life? And and so the use of of proxy and and her using other people to speak versus it being that we're hearing a, a computer generated voice is also another way of kind of like making it very personal. Um, and so as you would kind of introduce any character, even if it was just a moment within a scene, um, how would you map out those d- those details and, and those things that would tell us, you know, how deep in are they? How much have they kind of given, given themselves over to this? Absolutely. I think, you know, you you want to sort of know it's it's almost that binary, like, are you a wizard or are you a muggle? And it's like very important. I sort of, you know, look at all the the Marvel, uh, you know, post endgame films as like, did they blip or did they not? Like, it's so part of the identity of, of an individual character. And so I think that, you know, you had to know what is this character's engagement with Mrs. Davis, because it's going to be so, so strongly a part of how they interact with Simone and I think you know more interesting than that is Simone's assumption that everyone is almost like you know you all are in this (coughs) cult you know uh you're all you're all sheep and I'm not so even if you know we sort of 
unveil that you know someone has a story that's outside of you know the mrs davis uh narrative you know simone's assumption is that you know she's sort of us versus them and i think that's so much a part of her her journey going through this is that she does sort of need to reconnect sort of uncloister herself and just you know look at the world as like these are people you know they're not just puppets for it as she as she starts her journey but i think just on a basic basic storytelling level, you know, we also used sort of the earpiece to be our, you know, kind of shorthand is, you know, looking at a scene and saying like, wow, everyone's, you know, talking and they're talking on the phone. Is that to a friend or is that to Mrs. Davis? So that's a visual cue that- And is Mrs. Davis a friend? Right. What's the difference at that point? I, I also love the the Venn diagram of, of kind of different projects and different films and TV shows that it sounds like the two of you banded around in terms of thinking about ideas and and not even just in terms of the visual telling or the tone, but even narratively, you know, with the idea of sound of music, what does it look like when Maria leaves the convent? She's still just as convicted at, you know, looking at Black Mirror and true mo romance and the idea of a, a reluctant hero like Lord of the Rings. Um, and so how did kind of revisiting the idea of, of, of a lot of projects like that really influence the way that you were creating this kind kind of amalgamation of different tones into one space? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think that's a great question. And we very quickly sort of zeroed in on this idea of algorithms, um, in particular, love this idea of cliche. They, you know, if you basically ask an algorithm to kind of like scrape and comb through, like, what is it that humans are interested in? If you just asked it, like, what kind of stories do they want to be told over and over again? That like these sort of very similar, whether it's a ring or a holy uh, that you got to throw into Mordor or a holy, it's like the story is not that dissimilar. And so we, if we're going to start from a place of our, our, our villain character is really, really into cliches. How can we make the characters in the show self-aware of the cliche, but then they, th then they go on the grail quest anyway. And so the idea of when are we trolling? When are we extolling? You know, and, and then is there a way for us to kind of bring a potentially new and unpredictable idea in, in, into this where it's sort of like, when when you're describing an episode of mrs davis this is the heist one this is this is the, the you know this is the excala battle one this is the one where it's it's this it, it's a behind the scenes of, of making a you know uh like a movie or a commercial one like um each giving each episode sort of like its own identity and character but at the same time never sacrificing the you know, the care for the characters or the fact that they don't know that they're on a TV show, that they, they don't, they don't know that their primary function, they think they're real. And so we, it, it takes a lot of care, particularly when you're in such a heightened world um, that has such ridiculous plot points and twists to kind of always take a breath and say like, but what would someone do if this actually happened? What do they care about? What do they want? Um, uh, that, that became always our, our guiding light. And with the visual layering of the show, it, it very quickly is, is kind of self-referential. You know, we, we open on this scene where there's a lot of violence and we literally see blood spatter flying around. And then partway through that same episode, what, you know, there's the idea of what does it look like if we see Betty Gilpin and some of the other nuns being spattered with something, but actually it's jam instead, but there's a context that the show's already created. And so how do you work to kind of create visuals where in essence you're you're building on the layers that you've already visually created in your own show? Yeah, I mean a show that that holds as much as this show can at times, you know, you do want uh, sort of those those moments where it's like okay, uh one, you know, headless corpse is terrifying, two is uh maybe they're being lazy and forgot they already did that and then three is oh okay this is this is sort of an intentional motif uh throughout the series so you know it felt like opportunity to to 
you know, A, just layer in these big sort of dramatic cool moments, you know, who doesn't want to just like explode jam all over, you know, some some kindly nuns. But I would say to to the craft of it, you know, it really was our director who, you know, was able to pull out sort of these visual motifs and, and feel like along this, you know, wackadoo at times journey that we were crafting, that it was going to feel, you know, as much as we could communicate, hey, you're in safe hands, you know, this is all very intentional. These visual cues, as well as, you know, story cues are going to make it feel all like cohesive of of a piece. So it's all hopefully, you know, also fodder for for people who are viewing it and, you know, the internet to to sort of enjoy and and talk about and to create, you know, a real water culture, excuse me, water. I like water, water culture. culture. Let's go with that. A water culture show, <laughs> a water cooler <laughs> culture Turtles moment. And eggs. <laughs> it all <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> Season All two coming together uh, to get the opportunity to have, you know, a water cooler show that is is fodder for speculation and Easter eggs and, and mystery and, and mermaid eggs and mermaid eggs. It's, Did you know that? Did you know the mermaid's, the mermaid's laid, eggs? I learned that today. It's a new thing. I, I just learned hatched, that right now. <laughs> yeah. Hatch, pun intended, tracks, in this room. It tracks. It makes complete sense. I just never thought about it before, Tara. Tara told me all about it. It was great. It happens between interviews. Yes. <laughs> She's like the bottom half of them is a fish. Why so of course they lay, they lay eggs. eggs. Think about it. You know? <laughs> I know. You, it kind of changes the way you see the world. It, it changes the Little Mermaid exponentially as well. <laughs> that was our goal today. It changes it into a thing that I never want to see again. Take that into their press yeah. tour, please. Yeah. <laughs> And, and with the show as well, in, in terms of what you're talking about with the visuals, also just narratively, it's never afraid to kind of push the envelope. And, and I, I think, Damon, I've heard you talk about you're never kind of afraid to kind of like misdirect and lead the audience away from a moment a little bit, knowing that it's kind of an intentional playfulness. Um, and so how do the two of you really find those lines of how far can we really push and carry the audience and make sure that they're still going to be there within the moment with everything that we're creating? I mean, I think this is this is a place where it starts with Tara saying, I have a crazy idea um, or even not. I have a crazy idea, but I have an idea that I'm passionate about. And then I am the uh, I'm the receiver of that idea. And if it scares me, I tend to get quite excited by it. And then you try to resolve the paradox of what is it that made me afraid? Is the fear good or is there something is it something that needs to be mitigated is this an idea that requires uh like um a lot of time and thought in terms of being earned or can we overthink it and then it's not even fun anymore um and then once we get it to a place where the two of us were excited about it then it's ready to go into the room and then there are some ideas that we get excited about that the writers probably should have talked us out of and did, thank God. And then there are ones where the writers loved it as well and bolstered it even more. And then once it gets out of the room, then it goes to our our partners, whether it's at Peacock and Warner Brothers or Owen and Alethea or Fred Toy, the directors, because we can have a great idea on the page, but then the directors and the actors, they have to perform it, they have to execute it. And so I, I do believe that fortunately we're not novelists and so where in, in which case we have a bad idea, it just comes out of our fingers and it's on the page. But by time you get to see it, it's actually been vetted multiple times. And um, and and so uh, an idea that we were a little bit iffy or nervous about suddenly goes through the process and people are sort of like, oh, my God, that's crazy. I how are we going to make that work? We want to find a way to make that work it actually bolsters your confidence. And so I think like in, in, in improvisation, there's this idea of yes, anding something. And so like, once you s sort of set your brain towards the, the idea and the passion behind the idea um, is like, I may not entirely understand what it is you just said, but I can tell you're really into it. And that must mean that there's something really special there. Um, and maybe you need to explain it to me, or maybe we just trust one another. Um, but like, those are the ideas that kind of made it into the show. And I think that, um, through one lens, it's sort of like, oh, anything could happen, but we don't want to make a show where anything could happen. 
uh, it de- there, there, there is, there is a bar that we have to clear in terms of, you know, fundamental story credibility and emotional authenticity for the characters. There are certain things that our characters simply would refuse to do, not the actors, but the characters. I, I love that because in watching it, you can absolutely feel the the passion and the creativity in every single scene and every single moment. So thank you so much for talking about this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So we much. appreciate you. Thanks so much.